it doesn't matter whether you're consuming content that is pro-police or, you know, against police violence. What's actually having the most impact on your mind is sort of the anxiety producing and like freneticism of that form of content consumption. The following is a conversation with Dr. Derek Smith, a literature professor at Claremont McKenna College. Outside of the traditional college setting, Dr. Smith teaches inmates inside of American prisons. Today, we discuss what he's learned doing this work, what it'll take to completely eliminate crime, and how to genuinely build society anew. I'm Bashir, and this is the EBBF Podcast. And now, dear friends, here's Dr. Derek Smith. The first time that I had a course of my own inside of a prison was in upstate New York. Uh, it was a facility, uh, a maximum security facility uh, in a place called Cooksacky, um in upstate New York. And I remember going in there in the middle of winter, uh, everything is covered in snow and it feels like a kind of barren ice scape out there, you know, and going inside the barbed wire and passing through the gates and, you know, walking these corridors where you see a lot of uh, correctional officers sort of lined up along the corridors, pretty much, you know, glaring as you pass by them, you know, through these hallways that smell like uh, primarily like, you know, like disinfectant. And then getting into the uh, the college classrooms that were set aside for the courses that uh, I was teaching along with others and uh, really being struck by the kind of excitement and the um, gratitude of the incarcerated uh, men in there who were taking the class. And so that was a really uplifting kind of feeling to be with these um, with these people who were really excited to just do this intellectual work that um, made them feel as though there was some kind of contribution that they were actively concretely making to the building out of ideas which happened in those classrooms. And there was a sense of kind of, mm, I would say, upliftment that I got from being in those spaces. But then at the same time, I remember like where I was and the kind of mm, ice skate that I had come through to go inside the razor wire and down these corridors into a kind of almost like a sort of like it seemed like a dark sort of black hole in the middle of these facilities. And then imagining that there was no way that any of these guys would sort of emerge from there you know, with a kind of possibility in life. And what I ended up kind of recognizing over years and years of teaching is that um, people actually do emerge from prison, you know, and they do have the opportunity to begin new lives or to take up like the pieces of lives that have been uh, broken apart through incarceration and to sort of build again and try again. And oftentimes, uh, individuals can be quite successful in doing that, you know, in, in kind of uh, exercising this resilience that allows them to do um, great things in the world after incarceration. And so um, there was, you know, there were individuals who I met in those classrooms uh, and then who I became friends with after they came out, you know, and we met in the most kind of like glorious and like beautiful kind of settings, you know, outside of the prison, which was such a contrast to, you know, the place where we originally came to know one another. And so I would say that, you know, over time, I've been doing this for, I think about 12 years now, my thinking about, um, you know, the individuals and the future of those individuals in prison has really evolved as my relationships with them have grown, I've seen, you know, different kinds of conditions that people um, pass through uh, in their life, uh, in past through incarceration and then into the free world again. And um, I have a lot of thoughts about how 
education can contribute to the um, possibilities of those who are incarcerated. Are there any specific examples that come to mind about how education can contribute to the possibilities of those who are incarcerated? Sure. I mean, there, you, you know, I've probably had sort of maybe at this point a couple hundred, you know, students on the inside um, that I've worked with. And of course, some of those uh, individuals, or maybe not of course, but some of those individuals have gone on to um, really uh, achieve many impressive things. And for th those people, and even for others who maybe not, who haven't sort of gone on to uh, achieve impressively in sort of like traditional senses of the word, um, they ha have expressed a sense of kind of opening and a sense of affirmation that came from being exposed to ideas in the, the classroom, to be exposed to rigorous ideas, to being uh, respected as a person whose thoughts can uh, contribute to the advancement of the thinking of others, um, being respected as individuals who can build intellectual community, and um, the kind of affirmations and the kind of sense of having some kind of contribution to make in the world, I think comes out of these educational contexts and then has a, uh, can have a transformational effect on those who engage in those kinds of activities through education on the inside. And so um, there are, are many people who have gone from, you know, kind of being in places of solitary confinement for weeks or months, you know, inside of prisons to going into college classrooms to uh, entering the free world and then kind of uh, pursuing further education, like into the master's uh, level and so forth, even some PhD programs. And of course, then being able to use that kind of educational achievement to contribute to communities that they have uh, returned to. And so, you know, there are good numbers of examples of, of that, uh, that I have sort of seen that, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. Uh, my thinking is that most professors, their first thought in education wouldn't be to go and say, oh, I, I'm gonna teach at a prison but this is what you did. So I'm wondering what motivated this? What was the impetus for you starting to do this work? So when I uh, went into a PhD program in literature, I knew that I was gonna focus either on, you know, African-American literature, or uh, I was thinking about sort of the black diaspora and maybe literature of the black diaspora, the African diaspora. Um, and, you know, I was in, interested in engaging with the sort of social problems that uh, had affected black community. And so I thought that by becoming uh, very knowledgeable in one sort of area of that in, in the literature uh, of um, black people, that that would represent some kind of um, contribution to the alleviation of like the harms that uh, communities experience. And so uh, when I went into the PhD program and I thought that simply having kind of like knowledge is power, you could say power to make change, um, I ultimately discovered that I felt as though there wasn't, there was a limited amount of good that could be done you know, through having um, a kind of mastery of a certain body of knowledge, you know, that pertain to black people, like black literature, you know, um, but that that wasn't sort of fully kind of satisfying for me in terms of wanting to contribute to the betterment of humanity and uh, the bringing about of social change. And so 
I thought, well, what would be a place where I could take the skill set that I have and make it perhaps more consequential? And so, you know, that's when I began to think, oh, perhaps, you know, going inside to sort of teach in the prison context, which I viewed as being like the front lines of the battles against kind of like racial injustice, um, that that would be uh, a way that I could use the particular kind of capacities that I had to its most effect, its, its greatest effect. And so, you know, I kind of looked around, this is when I was in uh, teaching in New York, and it just turned out that I happened to be in upstate New York where there are a lot of prisons. And so there were um, prison, pro prison education programs that were um, going on in that, not, not so far from where I was. And so I kind of, I decided to get linked into those, and then, you know, I've, I've been uh, doing that for some time uh, since that happened. Now you're a professor at Claremont McKenna College, and you've actually combined students from there with students who are incarcerated. I'm wondering, what are the experiences that students have going through? Because I'm sure there's a lot of uh, preconceived notions about what it's going to be like. It's like, oh, We've seen movies, we've seen Shawshank Redemption, we've seen uh, prison scene and Breaking Bad, and it's, it's like this dark, violent place. But as you've said, uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of individuals, a lot of souls who are uh, seeking, seeking to better themselves, seeking uh, to be educated just as they are at uh, Claremont McKenna, which is... Uh, or an undergraduate institution. So like, what experiences do students have going there? Yeah, I mean, uh, I appreciate the fact that, you know, you chose to use that term souls who are seeking uh, for various things who are incarcerated. And I think like that's the key point, right? Is that those who are incarcerated are sort of as fully human as uh, those who aren't. And we all have these souls that uh, aspire toward kinds of spiritual attributes that you can find manifest in inside of prisons. And so there is joy, there is intelligence and curiosity and wisdom and generosity and compassion. And um, all of those things are kind of, as you said, from our uh, social conditioning through media or whatever received social narratives that we uh, imbibe. Uh, sometimes we don't believe that that actually kind of exists within the prison context, but it does. And certainly when students come in, not all of them have, uh, let's say, terribly warped notions about, you know, those who are inside. Some people even have family who are, who are locked up. Um, but it's always, it seems to me, surprising to students to see the degree of uh, curiosity and enthusiasm and gratitude that the incarcerated students uh, mostly have when they are um, engaged with others in, in the classroom, you know? And so invariably, the students who come from the outside are surprised by kind of like you could say the spiritual depth of those who they share the classroom with and in some ways you know because of various factors that we might go into at a later point um the depth of engagement and the depth of humanity that's felt in those uh classrooms surpasses that which is you know the norm in the traditional so classroom and in the free world college setting, you know? And so when students contrast what they're experiencing uh, on the regular with their college courses and then with these unusual courses inside uh, the prison, they often find that the prison uh, classes are much more uh, engaging and formative and sometimes rigorous, you know, than those on the outside. So I would say that's kind of like a lot of the experience that our students often have. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll share, a, you know, like a quick anecdote. You know, a lot of times, like people will, not a lot of, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't want to over exaggerate this, but um, 
you know, sometimes people will be in conversation with me and they'll ask, you know, well, what do you, what about sort of like being in the room with, you know, criminals and that kind of, that idea and that sort of the danger of that. And it's kind of uh, funny. I think the one, the one um, example that kind of sort of dispels this sort of sense of like the danger uh, that might uh, sort of characterize that classroom space uh, was with one uh, young woman who was a student in the class in one of the classes I had taught, and I don't know, she wasn't I would say wasn't the best student in in, the, in my classes. Uh, oftentimes she would come to to class a little bit tired and so forth, and the environment of the classroom was so welcoming and at ease that she fell asleep, you know, in the class and was ended up, had a kind of, her head was like resting on like the shoulder of like one of the incarcerated students, you know, <laughs> who she was sitting next to. And so that I think is just a good example of like the, um, the depth of, uh, or the, or the, you know, the kind of um, environment that can be created in these classrooms, which is not to say that, you know, the prison context doesn't have its own set of dangers, particularly for those who are incarcerated. Um, but, you know, for the students and for someone like me going into the classroom, it's oftentimes like a place of, you know, kind of like uh, ease and uh, sort of feeling of fulfillment, you know, more than anything else. It's interesting that you say, like, that. that's a really striking example in my mind, just the visual of being so relaxed that I actually fall asleep there. Like, I'm wondering, well, you've stated that the prison system is a Band-Aid for problems with education, with health care, with family, and, and, and we can't address the problem in the U.S. of mass incarceration without addressing those underlying issues. So I'm wondering, what are your thoughts on how, how we can actually address those uh, underlying issues? Because it isn't itself, we can't just talk about it in a vacuum. It's rooted in the context of American society and American history as well. Right. So uh, I would probably um, include myself in a kind of intellectual tradition that has been termed sort of abolitionist in that, you know, I think that the ideal of the abolition of the prison system as we know it um, is one that we could aspire to and we should aspire to. Uh, the prison system that we have right now uh, seems to uh, do great harms to many people and to replicate the harms of history that have been primarily visited on um, like non-white and particularly black people in the US. And you could say that the prison system is a reformulation of systems uh, that have been um, very effective at harming um, black people in, in the US. And so uh, that's one reason that I think that we should be aspiring and working toward a system uh, for the creation of social good um, that is very different than um, the prison system that we have today, which aims to sort of mitigate harms to community, uh, but actually one might make a strong argument sort of exacerbates the harms that are experienced by people in community and in, in, in sort of in American society, and particularly among certain communities within that society, and low-income uh, people being impacted most uh, significantly, and Black low-income communities um, with a quite intense kind of. Uh, punitive arrangements focused on, on those communities. Um, I believe that in order for us to move past the system of incarceration that we have today, 
it would not be sort of possible to just sort of say, well, we'll get rid of the existing prison system because um, without uh, a kind of a fundamental transformation of the, of the social systems that contextualize the, the prison system, we would simply get the reestablishment of uh, the kind of uh, harms that, have, that are being kind of like projected through the prison system, but just in another form. So we could just we could abolish prisons today if we wanted to, and some might say, well, we should do that, um, but without a sort of a larger framework for social transformation, it seems to me that it would simply be uh, reformulated, and so it would enact the same same kinds of social harms in other ways. So. Um, you know, the prison is a sort of a outgrowth of certain kinds of economic and social relationships that um, need to be sort of transformed. Uh, there are relationships between individuals and society and individuals in relationship to institutions and communities. And all those really have to be uh, reconstructed and, and reimagined, in my view, in order for us to get to the society uh, that is possible. So we have to work on rebuilding uh, or building anew um, the kind of society that we want. And so um, I think that there are many ways of doing that and there are many people who are involved in that kind of activity um, and that one of the, 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 ins the one of the ways that we can be inspired to do that work is by thinking about um, the great sort of injustices that kind of like play out on a regular basis <clears throat> in inside uh, of, of the prison system right and you know and outside the prison system too as a result of those who are incarcerated so oftentimes you know we think about um, the people themselves who are uh, locked up, uh, in in isolation from the communities and the families that they are no longer part of on the inside and the kind of like the destructive force that is um, f felt among uh, those who are in family and community with the incarcerated. And so when we think about the kind of the pain and the suffering that occurs not just for individuals but for entire communities, then we can be sort of I think, inspired toward uh, working for the change that we would want to see if we really care for uh, other people in our community, in our nation, sort of in our, in our, uh, you know, in our world. And so um, just thinking about sort of like the intensity of the pains that are created by uh, uh, the prison uh, helps us, I think, ins it inspire, can inspire us to work towards social transformation more broadly. Absolutely, because there's the individual, their family, society. There's a quote I think that is quite pertinent here. This is coming from some answered questions where Abdul Baha says, that the body politic builds prisons seeking thereby to reform the criminal Whereas in reality, this only brings about the degradation of morals and the subversion of character. He then offers the alternative that they should instead strive night and day, bending every effort to ensure that souls are pro properly educated, that they progress day by day, that they advance in science and learning, that they acquire praiseworthy virtues and laudable manners, and that they forsake violent behavior so that crimes may never occur. What are your thoughts on this? Right. So I often read. I, mean, I I I read that quotation as a call toward the creation of a society in which um, criminal activity doesn't happen. Right. And we know that crimes emerge from certain kinds of uh, uh, sort of social realities. You know, and oftentimes the, those uh, are related to the unequal distribution of resources and uh, um, sort of the modes of social interaction that are based on sort of competition and a kind of oppression 
uh, that characterize, you know, American society today, and that ultimately what we need to sort of work toward is the reformation of the society at large, right, or the recreation of, you know, the, the building of a new society as opposed to the reformation of individuals who uh, happen to be, uh, one might say, uh, the victims of a society which is not designed for the flourishment of all. Society as it's organized today is very effective at creating uh, conditions that allow for a certain uh, percentage of us to flourish. Uh, and it, simultaneously, it's effective at creating uh, conditions that uh, allow for a, a, a sizable number of us to uh, not flourish at all and to be sort of the recipients of punishments, right? Uh, we know that, you know, if you go through the foster system, for example, uh, you know, there's a high probability that you'll end up being sort of further, um, sort of if, if your life circumstances weren't a kind of punishment to begin with, it's likely that uh, when you go through the foster system, you end up in prison and being kind of like uh, the target of the punitive system of our society all over again, you know. Um, so how can you look at a young child who's five or six years old and is thrust into the foster system and ultimately ends up in prison and not say that it is the society that needs to be reformed as opposed to the individual that needs to be reformed, right? So Abdul Baha's uh, guidance, in, in my view, there uh, leads us toward a kind of thinking about, well, how do we sort of build a society that allows, elicits the the, the, the capacity and the, you know, the spiritual um, achievement of every individual. That's what we have to be sort of thinking about and working toward. And of course, as a, as a Baha'i community, we're trying to learn about that. How do you build those vibrant communities? Um, and of course, we're doing it at a, a kind of a small scale right now. But as we build um, society at a very small scale and continue to learn about it, um, as I see it, that will continue to, uh, our learning will expand and so will the, the sort of the circles of society, you could say, in which um, people's potential can be elicited to greater and greater effect, you know. So, yeah, we need to sort of reform, we think as, as Baha'is, we, you know, we're thinking about uh, the reformation of our own characters, but we're also thinking about that in conjunction with the reformation, the recreation, the building of the society that surrounds us as well. So the issue, or this issue of mass incarceration is deeply rooted in this 400 years of uh, racist history that the American society has undergone. Uh, on that subject, why do you believe that it's important or even absolutely necessary for us to examine this darker side of our history? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's important for us to understand the origins of the social forces that impact us now. Um, we might look around the world today and see certain kinds of uh, phenomena and if we don't understand their roots, you could say, if we don't understand the broader sweep of history that has led to the creation of these phenomena, I think that we might fundamentally misunderstand them. And then that may have some bearing on how we uh, interact with those phenomena, how we contribute to them, how we think about them, how we uh, seek to uh, remedy those phenomena which are harmful. And so, you know, I think that it's important for us to uh, begin to develop a um, informed, historically an informed and a historically informed understanding of issues that are important to us. Now, I think something that is interesting to consider is like, well, how much, you know, <laughs> information do we need? How, how, um, 
how detailed an understanding of like the story that goes into the past that we inherit is necessary. And I think that, of course, we can leave that to individuals to uh, determine, but it does seem to me that uh, uh, there's a kind of baseline knowledge of historical phenomena that really helps us to um, understand like the conditions that we are, are um, dealing with today. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I'll stop with that, yeah. There's, there's a story from, I believe it's the legend of King Arthur that says is like the knights of the round table are are searching for the the cup of the holy grail and they each go to the forest and enter the forest at the point that is darkest to them and uh, my understanding of the story is that it's a it's a call to us that because something is uncomfortable to examine uh, because it's uh, we don't want to go there that's not an excuse not to Actually, it's an injunction that uh, means that we have to. So like, I think just to understand this, like really we need to understand American history. Right. I mean, there's an anecdote that I often share, which is a kind of exemplary, exemplifying kind of metaphor for that same idea, which is one night when I lost my keys in the parking lot, you know, I started searching for my keys and uh, many people started to help me search for my keys. And we were all looking underneath this lamp post where the light was shining down. And then somebody came up behind us and asked, you know, well, wh wh what are you looking for? I said, well, I lost my keys. And they said, well, did you lose your keys underneath the lamp post right here where the light is shining? I said, no, you know, I lost them out there in the darkness, but uh, we prefer to look here in the light. And of course, you know, uh, the one interpretation of that kind of story is that in order to find the keys to open up the sort of understand the doors of understanding, we often need to go to these places which are uh, hard to look at. And so uh, when we do that, I think um, it can do various things for us and it can sort of uh, lead us into f futures of understanding. So my uh, thinking about understanding the history or the or, or the past, history and the past, is not to sort of stay there or to kind of um, be overwhelmed by that history, but rather to use it as a kind of inspiration toward the chain toward making changes that will impact the future. And so sometimes we can get sort of overly uh, consumed by a historical understanding and not put that in its proper relationship to the um, future that we want to create, actually. Yeah, like de denying history or denying uh, just things that we study, it's not going to uh, get us to be able to build something anew. Like there's, uh, I listened to this lecture by uh, Dr. Robert Sapolsky, who's a biologist at Stanford University, and he was talking about uh, behavioral genetics and uh, something called well, what's colloquially co colloquially known as the psychopath gene. And what's interesting about this is that it's a gene that some people have, but it's only turned on, it's only activated if that individual. Uh, went through an abusive upbringing. So like serial killers like uh, Ted Bundy and, uh, and Ed Kramer, C1, like the people they make Netflix dramas about uh, likely had this. But then kind of returning to that quote I shared earlier, just because someone has it doesn't mean that it's deterministic that they're going to end up as a killer. But it's, uh, it's the environment with which they're raised as well. So to deny the existence of that isn't, uh, doesn't get us anywhere, but really we need to recognize, okay, that just underscores how important, uh, how important our environments are as well. Yeah, this is a good point, right. 
the environments that we are operating within will elicit certain kinds of behaviors from us. And um, one of the reasons that we are, I think, working to build society anew is that so many of the systems that we have don't actually elicit those elements of our higher nature, what we would think of as our spiritual nature, but actually uh, elicit from us elements of our lower nature. You know, they kind of uh, activate the animal within us. And, you know, we are trying to create uh, societies and communities that activate the spiritual within us, right? Yeah. One other example, there's something, it's, it's the sociological phenomenon. It's called the Gini coefficient, and it's a measure of relative wealth inequality in a given area. So somewhere uh, like a, a wealthy neighborhood has a low Gini coefficient because even though people are generally wealthy, um, between them there isn't much difference. And the same goes for uh, a, a less wealthy area. Um, I've got a, a good friend in, in the DRC and uh, where he is low uh, Gini coefficient. But when there's high inequality in a given area, the uh, rates of male homicide are greatly increased. Like there's a very close correlation between Gini, the Gini coefficient and male homicide. So it's um, like this trying to eliminate or trying to reduce violence is also rooted in the elimination of the extremes of wealth and poverty because if people uh, like if I'm uh, if I'm in an area where I see that some people have uh, these great opportunities and I'm I don't like, uh, what am I going to turn to and uh, I, it may be violence right and sort of like this unequal distribution of economic and social opportunity kind of leads us to a kind, uh, usually like to this, I don't know if it's a horizon, but a ideal of distributive justice, right? Where it's kind of like the goods of society are equally sort of distributed, right? Um, but there's an interesting kind of phenomena that uh, people are beginning to learn about and just a small group of people. Um, and that's a, a concept called contributive justice, right? In that our horizon, and I think this is true of the community building work that uh, we do in the Baha'i world, our horizon is set on a social, environment in which all people are able to actively contribute in fulfilling ways to the construction of a society, right? And that the truest form or the highest form of uh, kind of justice is one where every individual is not simply like the recipient of a certain amount of goods, right? But is actually uh, living out their spiritual potential by building a society, you know, in ways that bring them joy and fulfillment, right? And so that um, our horizon of vision may be trained now, especially within the Baha'i community, on a sort of a vision of contributive justice, right? Where we are uh, seeking to contribute to the construction of something that, uh, is gratifying to our deep sort of, or, or to our higher nature, you know? Have you seen that in action or like this, these community building efforts and then also contributive justice? Right, so um, in a, in this is now, you know, I should be clear, this is not to sort of mitigate the importance of a kind of distributive justice, right? That there is a certain form of, um, let's say, material well-being, spiritual well-being, which is important for all of us to have, 
right? Um, but one of the things that you can see in places where the uh, community building process is happening in places where there may be uh, high Gini coefficients is that you know young men are contributing to the construction of a community and they are not exhibiting any forms of sort of violent inclination at all but rather quite the contrary you know they are contributing to the upliftment of those who are younger than themselves and they're helping to accompany um, children and junior youth into a process of community building that these uh, these children, junior youth, in turn, will contribute to. And so although uh, those young men in, con in conditions of, uh, that are characterized by high Gini coefficients may not be the, they may not have the most material and economic resources, they are um, experiencing, I think, a process that uh, recognizes the importance of the contribution of anyone. Right? Anybody can be a protagonist, and it doesn't matter sort of how much material resources you have, how much intellectual uh, kind of experience you have, how much educational background you might have. You can contribute to um, on equal footing with anyone else to the building of a kind of a new community um, by being involved in, in these processes that Baha'is are learning about throughout the world. So, I mean, I there are examples of it, you know, that I sort of witnessed myself, you know. Uh, do any particular anecdotes come to mind? Well, I mean, there's anecdotes. I, I, I hesitate to sort of, you know, kind of be too specific about them, you know, so as to not kind of like uh, identify uh, people closely. But, I mean, one of the things that, y you know, you see, I think, even already in, in, in the U.S. is uh, neighborhoods in which, um, there are those who might be kind of like involved in activities that we can oftentimes sort of think of as criminal activities um, who are leaving aside, right, or turning away from those kinds of activities in order to contribute to um, activities that bring about the social amelioration rather than social harm, right? So if we could just, if we're gonna kind of like put a, 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 a very, um, in a, you know, inadequate definition on criminal activity, you could say, well, it's activity that creates social harm in some way, right? And so what we will see is individuals, youth, who may be uh, sort of, um, of the profile that may be susceptible to contributing to social harms through certain activities, instead of doing that, right, who now with a kind of vision of a community building process that they can contribute to, then begin to create social amelioration. You know, they begin to accompany those who are younger than themselves and to be a wise advisor for, you know, uh, 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 youngsters who may look up to them. And so I think that you can see that uh, in uh, community after community where the institute process that we're learning about uh, is taking root uh, within those neighborhoods where, you know, crime is a, is a, is a real, is a reality that people deal with on a daily basis. Where would you say that vision comes from? Like on the ground, I feel like it has to be tangible for people that uh, I can be a I can be a junior youth animator because I've seen how maybe how I was uh, how that supported me and I want to pass that on or I've seen others and how it's uh, helped them transform so I feel like there has to be kind of a, a first step kind of on the ground I don't know if you could speak to that right well I mean it it, it is a requires something you know from a relatively simple from the standpoint of the learning that has accumulated in, in the Baha'i community right and that is uh, well I should say simple 
but also quite challenging and difficult. And that is, you know, a, a group of friends who are committed to uh, the development of a process in a certain geographic space. And that begins with having conversations, whether that's by kind of like rolling up on people in the park or rolling up to their doors and knocking on them and saying, look, we have this opportunity to um, contribute to the betterment of the community that we live in. And it involves a spiritual education program for children, junior youth, and youth, and you can participate in it and you can contribute to it. And once enough of those conversations happen, a core group of children and junior youth are established, and then a process over time that regularly uh, sort of uh, uh, advances, begins to create a reality that is experienced and felt by those who are within it and those who observe it. And so then those who are observing it and can, can see this process unfolding in which a set of people are committed to high ideals that engage young people, um, they can, observers can see that and then be attracted to that and then want to contribute to it. And it's, you know, again, it's a very simple process on the one hand, given that we have a curriculum and a wealth of knowledge about how to uh, sort of go about the creation of this process. But then on the other hand, it's incredibly difficult because it requires consistency of effort, continuity over time, uh, individual sacrifice and ability to sort of uh, encounter crisis and move through it and not get overly uh, wedded to victories that may happen here or there. But, you know, uh, be in a process of action and reflection that carries along, that carries out over time, you know? And so I think where those things are happening, youth see it, you know? And a certain number of youth are inevitably going to be attracted to that, right? And we can see examples of that here and there. And I think personally that we are in the early stages of a process that is going to you know, continue to flourish. And we'll see more and more examples of this and more and more places uh, in the United States as we're seeing them in more and more places throughout the world. Do you have any thoughts on the idea of like, raising local capacity that uh, like it, it isn't some hero, some organization coming out of the sky, but actually these these are grassroots movements or grassroots efforts from from the ground level? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. Because, you know, the, uh, the Universal House of Justice, of course, the head of the Baha'i Faith, the institution that we look to for our guidance and understanding the unfoldment of the what Baha'is believe to be the divine plan that is operating in the world today, um, you know, they encourage us not to be dichotomous in our thinking. So I'll appeal to that idea to say that um, there are good programs that come in and help people. You know, I don't, I don't think that our vision is one that is meant to deride or um, kind of uh, throw uh, suspicion on those kinds of programs. Uh, the one that we're learning about is not one in which, you know, we come in to provide like a service for a community. Um, it's one that kind of believes in the inherent potential of every individual to contribute to a process and to be a protagonist in a, a process, and then uh, kind of uses this sort of method of individuals accompanying other individuals to raise their capacity. And as more and more people at every sort of, uh, sort of, uh, sort of level of involvement with the process um, raise their capacity, then you can see a general capacity building um, phenomena occur. And so I, I think, again, in the United States, we have um, sort of a few kind of examples of that where the capacity of young people to accompany other young people uh, is being <clears throat> learned about very effectively. And you can see examples of it. Um, and, and that 
is a different model of social transformation uh, than the one that is often sort of thought about in a lot of development schemes, which um, expect someone with great capacity to come in and then uh, sort of contribute their uh, exceptional talents to the betterment of a community, right? And so this gets out of a little bit of like the individualistic approach to uh, creating social transformation into one that is more collectivist and uh, kind of like seeks universal protagonism as as an ideal. And you know, this is one thing that we're learning about that in the institute process that Baha'is are are working with through throughout the U.S. And it's not just a uniquely American phenomenon. When I was in the Holy Land, I learned about uh, some of the efforts that are going on across the world. And one particular story has really stuck with me. And this is coming from the Central African Republic. So this is a country where uh, one of the chief issues that for a number of years uh, the people were dealing with was violent conflict between uh, militia groups rooted in, well, this is a, it was a religious conflict. And of course, the Baha'i writings uh, say that, um, I'm looking for the quote. Well, the Universal House of Justice has said that uh, conflict and contention ultimately yield to more conflict and contention. So this is a, a major issue, and one of its big effects was on education. So in a bunch of different villages, uh, teachers who had been brought in from, I believe, were the big cities, they didn't want to stay because it's um, kind of dangerous. And so just this teacher retention was a major problem. So then what uh, some efforts were raised in the Baha'i community, it's like, okay, how can we raise local capacity to have teachers from the villages be able to teach and then uh, since they're from here, they're invested here. And they did this, and they opened up a school, and it worked. So because of the conflict the enti across the entire country, there uh, were no public schools open. And the government was pretty astonished that uh, this small community had been able to do what they didn't. So they actually sent the uh, Ministry of Education and the Parliament to figure out, okay, what... What was going on here that, uh, could, is that something that we could replicate? And it was this, this key of local capacity, that the people uh, from each place were, were trained with, uh, to be able to pass on uh, learning and knowledge to, to the next generation. So inspired by this, they actually took that program, ran a pilot uh, study in 20 villages to see is it replicable it was and then actually the government of the Central African Republic uh, adopted that system to roll out nationwide so from this one from this one area it then affected the entire country right that's a wonderful example um, because one of the things that sort of you describe it seems um, and I, and I believe I've, I've heard about this example uh, as well, is that um, a model of capacity building that was a proven among a small group of people uh, actually sort of replicated quite quickly, not because the small group of people decided that they were going to sort of try a national campaign of capacity building, but rather that they were going to do it within a small context that would then sort of attract the um, observation, you could say, of others who might be interested in replicating it, right? And so I think that this is the model of small-scale grassroots capacity building that in the U.S., uh, we're still sort of in the early stages of. We, we would acknowledge that in the Central African Republic, they're probably uh, more advanced in this 
uh, sort of model of grassroots com community building than we are. And yet still, you know, we can see examples, like I'll just give a very simple one in my own uh, little neighborhood um, that uh, we live in, where, you know, there is a junior youth who was, as he was engaged in the process, had a real propensity toward using uh, colorful language, you know, and over, it was, it was uh, almost, it, it was so reflexive and so much a part of this uh, junior youth second nature, uh, nature that uh, it seemed as though it was uncontrollable. But, you know, being in the context of uh, relationships in which we're trying to develop the powers of expression and the power of uh, sort of self-reflection uh, in people of that age, over time, what we see is that when he comes into that context, uh, he does have that capacity to sort of um, adjust his language in a way with, that he controls, right? And so one could say that that's a tiny example of capacity building in just one uh, in individual, right? And of course, as we learn more and more about capacity building and all of its kinds of uh, permutations, eventually what will happen is that there will be, in my view, these kinds of moments and opportunities for uh, breakthroughs, you know, in which it will be like, oh, we see a sort of a critical mass of uh, capacity building happening in one area and necessarily people will come look at it, you know? Why is it that there is this sort of group of young people who seem um, to uh, be able to create havens of like love and justice and peace uh, within them um, and are able to do it a consistent basis and more and more youth are curious about this and as this sort of attractive power grows then it will invite I think more observation and eventually uh, you know replication even by those who you know are not right now familiar with the Baha'i faith and its um, society building efforts uh, that are happening in the U.S. I'm talking about. This kind of gets at the the game theory of how do self-interested people engage in or become self-interested enough to engage in a selfless process. And uh, one way to look at this is we can imagine uh, a nation that is... Well, at a country level, it's built on principles of justice, of unity, cooperation, that in the long run, those virtues will enable them to prosper materially. And as a result of that, they start exporting uh, material goods. And then uh, if other nations have uh, then fallen behind, it's like, why are you able to do this when we with all our bickering aren't then that's at that point that the, the virtuous area then exports ideas so this is on the level of like nation states and uh, global commerce but it also applies to to a neighborhood to a family at these very small units because it's clear looking around that people aren't aren't exactly having a great time like you read uh, Jonathan Haidt's new book, The Anxious Generation. It's like my generation, Gen Z, rates of depression, of uh, anxiety, other mental ailments are just off the charts almost. And it's like people are hurting. And I think because of that, they're looking for another way. Right, looking for a concrete community that is characterized by love, right? I mean, and that's hard to find in in um, you know in in substantive ways, right? Um, and so this these efforts that we are learning about to to create these small communities that are characterized um, by love that is attractive, right? And there is a certain degree of self interest that might lead a youth to want to be part of this community in which uh, sacrificial service is at its heart, right? So I'm self-interested 
be insofar as I want to be in a community of love. And as I enter into that community, I find that people are uh, sacrificing in order to build a world anew, I think, as the Universal House of Justice calls it, in these havens, that's what we see. So yeah, I like that idea of like, ultimately, uh, maybe many people will be driven by self-interest uh, and because they want to find uh, places of comfort. But in those places of comfort, it's not a place of complacency. It's not a place of passivity, right? Um, we find that the love that is most powerful is going to be generated through service to others. And so you're self-interested, but it kind of turns into opportunities for sacrificial service. One of the most effective ways to increase your own happiness is to help someone else to do something for others so like if we all knew that it's like oh i'm feeling down therefore i should do something for someone else then it's just that would just cascade yeah we know abdul baha says says that when you're feeling you know as though there's nothing that can lift you up that's the time when you find another person who may be more desperate than you to uh, contribute to their well-being. I don't know, you seem like a person who's often very happy. Do you, uh, um, you know, or do you use that uh, practice yourself? I mean, and you also seem like the kind of person who, you know, puts into practice certain kinds of principles in very concrete ways. So do you do that? Well, I'll share, I was worked at this after-school children's program uh, while I was uh, in my most recent semester of school. And the reason I joined was actually out of self-interest because I knew that the happiness literature, uh, it's like, I knew, it's like, okay, uh, like I would not mind being more cheerful, more happy. It's like, I'm, I'm kind of acting a bit selfishly most of the time. Let me, let me actually do something for others. And yeah, it definitely did have, have an effect, especially there were so this was a program with uh, like first second and third graders and there were these two young boys who uh, particularly uh, they had an affinity for me and I don't know if it's something about male role models or just I was there and they thought I was cool but I, I really enjoyed that right yeah I think that well I could go on about this, but I mean, I think that that idea of like younger people looking up to those who are just a little bit older than them, right? And so uh, obviously many, uh, many people who are in their teen years are desperate for people that they can have an impact on, right? They want to be uh, looked up to and they want to be uh, loved, you know? And ironically, there is a very simple system is that if you look toward those who are a little bit younger than you and you become a true friend to them, those who are younger, you know, will be so overwhelmed uh, by this sort of gesture of comfort and accompaniment and that they'll then uh, sort of, uh, uh, embrace you know that youth who's a, just a little bit older than them and who shows them love kind of back to your question on just being joyful being happy i feel like it's similar to confidence in that like just showing up is 80 percent of the work that if you're excited to see people they'll be excited and then you'll be happy too and kind of on that note i'm wondering I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on in the world. Uh, we have, uh, from the Baha'i writings, this uh, understanding about these two processes, the process of integration and, in, and disintegration. And a lot of what we've been talking about today has been about integration, these community building activities. But then there's also disintegration, the, uh, the old world order falling apart. So it's like things are getting worse, but not only are they getting worse, they're getting worse faster. For you, like, how do you stay grounded in these times when, like, any time I look at the news, I just get pulled down into the muck? Yeah, I think that what well, my approach is to have a kind of curated, a 
approach to media generally. So my belief is that much of the media that is sort of produced for us to consume is actually sort of spiritually uh, uh, sort of spiritually, not debilitating is too strong of a word, but it does not spiritually empower me. So, you know, I tend to be um, guarded, you could say, in the way that I consume media and its representation of what is happening in the world. Uh, of course, there is a over-representation of the disintegrative forces. And so, uh, if those disintegrative forces cause me to have uh, a lot of uh, kind of like concern or anxiety, um, I feel confident in the decision to shield myself from that, which is not to say like I'm some kind of like ostrich with my head stuck in the sand, you know, but it's just that I think, you know, that, that we can unplug much more than we often do. And so I try to stay relatively unplugged while still knowing what's happening in the world, you know, and so uh, I think that the disintegrative forces will make themselves known to me and that what I can spend a lot more time on is thinking about the integrative forces. And if I kind of look around at community and I look around at individuals who are um, working together to do positive things and to love one another as millions and billions of people are doing within families and communities throughout the world, uh, that gives me heart, you know, and hope. And so I tend to be um, more aloof from traditional forms of media representations of the world, let's say. Do you feel that if there are big events that are relevant to your own life in the news that it'll reach you just by word of mouth, people will be talking about it? Uh, I think that's one thing that'll happen. I mean, you know, those who are near to me will certainly talk about it. And, you know, it's not like I don't uh, kind of like try and find out about things, but, you know, like oftentimes like I'll read about it because sort of the sensationalism and the kinds of uh, emotional, uh, guidance that the many forms of media offer, I don't think is necessary for understanding the events, right? I think, in fact, maybe it's even easier and better to understand those events in contexts or through media that are not commercialized, for example, um, or that, you know, are not overly commercialized. I think it's super difficult to know also to get the reality of a certain situation. Like we've been talking about race a fair bit in this conversation. And one, one thing that we haven't touched on is like police violence. And I'm looking at this not from the issue itself, but more from the meta level of this conversation on media, where I heard, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Tristan Harris. He's... Uh, He's the guy behind the Social Dilemma film documentary about social media. And also the he founded the Center for Humane Technology. And he was talking about this experiment he ran where he opened up two Facebook accounts. And on one, he followed uh, certain groups uh, that were discussing police brutality. And then on another, he followed like pro-police groups. And then he just started scrolling for about 10 minutes. And he said he could feel himself getting pulled in different directions just based on the content that he was seeing where like he was um it was just like kind of getting pulled to the most extreme of an issue and when the truth is was is uh in the middle somewhere right i mean i would say that maybe the truth is oftentimes not what is represented through um, a media stream 
that is invested with a certain kind of political aim, right? Um, you will discard facts that don't comply with your vision and you may um, exaggerate or pay particular attention to uh, facts that do reinforce your vision. Obviously, we all know about that. And so, um, you know, like I, I don't do social media. And so uh, I kind of stay a little bit uh, removed from that. Um, but then the question is, well, like, how do you learn about uh, uh, issues? And again, you know, I think it, you know, being somebody like, you know, who's trained to be a researcher, you know, who has some kind of experience as a scholar, um, you begin to look at issues deeply. And as you look at them deeply, you understand that oftentimes the superficial uh, representation of an issue that you may get in popular media is really just a distortion of the complexities of the of the issues that we have to that we want to think about. So, which is all to say, like, um, I think it's it's hard for us to navigate the media sphere and to understand these disintegrative forces. Uh, I think also we have to determine what our purposes are, what is our end goal in whatever, how we see ourselves, how we see ourselves contributing to the world. And if a consumption of media is impeding me from achieving the goal that I have, uh, if it brings me down such that I can't give energy to what I want to do, then I gotta shield myself from that, right? Um, but there's some people are fueled by seeing things that are uh, um, unjust and wanting to work toward justice, for example, right? But then of course that has to be also balanced by um, attention to issues such as love and compassion and generosity, right? There is a whole kind of constellation of principles that as Baha'is we're always calling upon as we engage uh, with issues. So it's, it's hard, you know, and we, of course, we, we have to be most uh, in touch with the, the writings uh, of, of Baha'u'llah and of Abdul Baha and the guidance that comes to us, you know, through the Guardian and, and uh, the Universal House of Justice. I mean, those should be our primary touchstones, I think. I hadn't thought about using that almost as a fuel. You know, Abdul Baha talks about these certain emotions, like greed and anger, as being neutral and neither good nor bad, but what determines their worth is what they're directed towards. So he says, anger at the injustices in the world is praiseworthy, uh, or having greed for uh, to try establish the the better betterment of the world that's also praiseworthy. And of course, selfish greed is uh, that's a no go, and same for like selfish anger. But it's like about what it's directed towards. Yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, also like there, the one that the the characterization of emotion that is most fascinating to me is like a joy, right? And there's various things that joy allows, and uh, one of the things that Abdul Baha says is that joy makes the intellect keener, right? And so it's like, wow, you know, it's like just being joyful can actually 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 make you think more precisely, which is sort of a fascinating concept, you know. And so, like, what kinds of things am I doing to uh, sort of elicit joy from my being? You know, like, that's, I don't know if social media feeds do that so often. Shifting gears a little bit. If I can also say something about that, just go back to that a second. Yeah. Like, you know, there are certain, maybe you're familiar with this. I think Hyde probably talks about it in his book, but, like, there's the media 
um, uh, scholar, um, oh Lord, I'm forgetting this guy's name now for a second. Um, Neil Postman writes about him and Marshall McEwen uh, has this concept that the medium is the message, the content is the distraction, right? So that the form in which we are given certain ideas, right, has embedded with it certain kinds of mind and emotion shaping um, qualities. So when you are uh, um, kind of engaged in social media, the structure, the form of uh, consumption, which is leading you towards shorter and shorter uh, times of engagement, right? It leads you to seek more and more um, stimulation, right? And it feeds the mind's craving for excitement, right? It's actually that process, that form of social media as we consume it through the, you know, these platforms that is most shaping to our consciousness as opposed to actually the content that is within it. So it doesn't matter whether you're um, consuming content that is pro-police or you know against police violence. What's actually having the most impact on your mind is sort of the anxiety producing and like freneticism of that form of content consumption, right? Through social media. And so, uh, we have to be judicious in the way that we even use the technologies themselves, right? Because it doesn't matter what we're doing with it, the technology itself is kind of shaping our psycho, spiritual, emotional uh, being, you know, as we use them. I'm so glad you bring up Neil Postman. His book, Amusing Ourselves to Death, is so relevant, despite the fact that it was written either in the 80s or 90s, it is more relevant today. And he talks about exactly this, that the medium through which we are consuming content is what shapes our thought. And one fascinating example he shared is that uh, during, um, this is pre-Civil War, uh, Abraham Lincoln and Stephen Douglas were debating uh, how you should approach slavery. And so the content aside, the manner with which they were debating is crazy. So what they had, he said, is like, um, one of them would would give and present their argument, and they would talk for uh, three hours. And people would come, and they would watch this, and they would consume all of that, and then they would evaluate it. And three hours is a long time. And so then they'd go home, they'd have dinner, and then they'd come back to watch a four-hour rebuttal. So like people's ability to retain verbal information, follow an argument at the time, that is like the complete opposite of what I would call TikTok ideology. Right. I, I remember that sequence in the book. Um, and, you know, that kind of also reminds me of, you know, the Universal House of Justice talking about the way in which we live in a society that speaks more and more in the form of slogans, right? And so when your ideas are reduced to just a few sound, uh, you know, soundbite worthy words, right, that has an effect on the way that we think about the world and its complexities. And I think it does us a disservice, you know, to think in these uh, very truncated and simplistic ways that, you know, is emerges basically from the technologies that sort of shape our uh, societies today, you know. Um, and in that book, I like the, the, the very clear point that Postman makes about the moment that you start taking into account what the news reader looks like is the moment that you stop making news uh, about the information it provides and more about the entertainment it provides, right? So that if the news reader has to have a certain kind of aesthetic appeal, 
then what really becomes a, a sort of a primary driving force in the delivery of the news is its aesthetic appeal, its emotional appeal. Uh, and so we have seen sort of now that um, primarily what we want to do is think about issues of policy and so forth uh, through the mode of entertainment more than anything else. Um, certainly, it seems as though uh, our politicians are driven by the need to entertain the masses. And I think that, of course, is wildly sort of detrimental to our ability to do good assessment of the forces that are disintegrating and integrating, you know, our societies. And that need to be entertained is rooted in something Baha'u'llah Baha warns against, which is idleness. And that we're to, to set our aims on that, which will rehabilitate the fortunes of mankind. But I feel like no matter what we're consuming, if we are consuming a lot that is passive and regardless of, oh, this is inspirational content, it's not taking action. Yeah, yeah. We have to be protagonists. We can't be uh, passive recipients of ideas, no matter how profound they might be, actually, you know, entertaining or profound. We have to put them into action somehow. Shifting gears a little bit, you wrote an article in the Journal of Baha'i Studies called Centering the People of the Eye. Real quick, these are the first few lines from that article. In the late 19th century, Baha'u'llah likened people of African descent to the pupil of the eye, through which the light of the spirit shineth forth. Uh, first, well, before we get into what this metaphor is and why you believe it's important, could you speak a little bit on the historical context of when that was made and what was going on at the time? Uh, the people of the eye metaphor? Yes. Right. So, I mean, w this is the m metaphor that Baha'u'llah used to talk about uh, black people in the 19th century. And we're, I think, unsure of the exact date in which um, Baha'u'llah first used this metaphor. Abdul Baha. Uh, attributed to him, right? So um, we probably assume that it was somewhere, you know, in the 1870s or thereabouts, right? Um, and that, of course, in that time, um, what we think of as anti-Black racism was at a very high pitch. Um, there were very few, if any, um, evaluations of blackness as a quality uh, of physiology that was beautiful or that associated um, positive ideas with black cultures, black people, and so forth. And so What's so remarkable about this statement by Baha'u'llah, I think, is that it takes one of the primary defining uh, social discourses of that time period, as the, the discourse on race, and introduces a concept which totally sort of reorder, reorders that discourse and that asks uh, those who would take Baha'u'llah seriously to radically rethink their understanding of blackness um, through this metaphor. And so uh, it's just, to me, uh, a example of sort of the originality of Baha'u'llah's thought, the way in which it's seemingly impossible to attribute the kinds of ideas that 
Baha'u'llah was offering up in order to create the unity of humanity that was his that is his ultimate objective. Um, he didn't get those from some other human source. These seem to me to be this this metaphor seems to be a confirmation of the uniquely inspired, um, let's say, spiritual medicine that Baha'u'llah was sharing with humanity uh, to achieve that ends of its oneness. And so, you know, I was drawn to it for various reasons, and you know, I tried to write about it in ways that I thought were fresh and, and new, you know. What was this new understanding uh, that resulted, or that we can get as a result of this metaphor? Well, I mean, to put it in, in the simplest terms, right, it took blackness, which was always in the, um, since the sort of the formation of racial understandings and it's kind of the way that they crystallized in the period of like, let's say the 1700s and the 1800s uh, in a way that was always negative. And it turned this understanding of blackness that had crystallized in that time period um, into something positive, right? So it was always a sign of deficit and sin and so forth, right? In Baha'u'llah's uh, language, it was turned into the sign of spiritual enlightenment, which was a kind of, one could say like a 180 degree turn from the mainstream of racial discourse at that time. You called this an epistemological rupture. Can you explain what that means and why you gave it that description? Yeah, well, I mean, I think epistemology has to do with the way that we know about the world, the way that we understand the world, the, the, the sort of the, the structures that allow us to make sense of our reality. And the epistemologies of the 19th century that were, that were influencing the way that people understood the world were ones that... Uh, consistently degraded blackness. So that even people who were in favor of a kind of equality between um, races, including the black race, um, they didn't see blackness as a kind of thing to be exalted and extolled. It was mostly along the lines of black people, particularly in their form, in their cultural forms, were not as advanced as others, were not as, um, did not contribute to humanity in the way that others, but yet still they deserved certain kinds of protections okay, in the social order. That's for even people who are, who are trying to win protections for black people in these Western social orders. So uh, what is so different and what creates the rupture is that Baha'u'llah says it's not just simply that, um, you know, black people are um, worthy of protections in a social order. is not simply that there is something that is fundamentally and fully human about them, but there may also be some kind of special qualities and capacities which are inherent in the condition of blackness, right? And that um, this should be recognized. And I think that that's a kind of again, a wildly um, different sort of conception, racial conception uh, than was there before. And it represented a, a epistemological rupture insofar as that kind of like 
it burst into ways of knowing to allow for new things to be uh, considered, right? Well, we as Baha'is have this idea of the, the oneness of mankind. And Shoghi Effendi says that uh, the principle, this principle of the oneness of mankind is no mere outburst of ignorant emotionalism or an expression of vague and pious hope. Its implications are deeper. And I think that just recognizing, well, it, it doesn't just go beyond recognizing the nobility of everyone, but it's like they're, I mean, as Shirley Effendi says, it, it's far deeper. And I think you touch on that with like, exploring this metaphor. Yeah, I mean, so the... Um... The oneness of humanity is a, is a fact, right? This is um, that which has been confirmed is the oneness of, of, of humankind, right? I mean, like this is this is the truth, um, and this is not something that is just sort of like a, a kind of a lofty hope and a goal, but it's something that um, we have to work to recognize the implications of, right? And if there are some of the implications of the oneness of humanity are that those who have been, um, those members of the human family that have been the recipients of particular kinds of, of hard, hardships and particular kinds of marginalizations it may be that in order for us to achieve the oneness that we seek and the oneness that is a, a sort of a, a sort of spiritual uh, reality, as a, uh, it will be necessary to address the historical marginalization and the harms that have been visited on those people. Like, it has to be addressed in some way. It can't just be... Uh, thought about as relegated to history and now we can begin anew. We have to have means and means for uh, bringing about that oneness. And as I see it, this concept of the people of the eye is one of those means and tools that, that we can use in order to bring about oneness. Now, this is not to say that black people are somehow exceptionally uh, gifted, you know, uh, just by virtue of their race. I think it means that um, the way in which modern society has been constructed tends to place a cultural burden on people who are perceived to be Black. And that so struggling with that cultural burden oftentimes will give black people a kind of perception, like a spiritual vision that, is, that, that, that kind of comes through hardship, right? And that so perhaps sort of recognizing that there is some uh, enhanced perception that black people may have of spiritual reality by virtue of them dealing with this social stigma uh, is something that we could consider. That may be one way of like reading the people of the eye metaphor. And so um, if we begin to sort of see value in the contributions and the ideas and the perceptions of black people, that may then help us more effectively build, uh, 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 build a society which, rec which is reflective of the implications of the oneness of humanity we we may say that you know the problem that we face in society is the lack of uh, unity uh, that we find and um, along certain kinds of identity boundaries and that those who have had to deal with that uh, lack of unity in its most negative forms are black people and therefore, if we're working toward unity, 
there may be great sort of stores of knowledge and understanding and insights that black people have uh, by virtue of being those who have dealt with the problem of disunity uh, in its most egregious ways, in its most egregious forms. I think that that might be a great place to end it. Uh, just to share one final quote. Uh, this is in reference to uh, Baha'u'llah, that he has, uh, he hath his finger on the pulse of mankind. He perceiveth the disease, prescribeth in his unerring wisdom the remedy. So from this, we have like, all of these teachings, but it's our job to uh, to learn, to experiment, to determine how to put them in action with these community building activities, with this um, intellectual vigor. I think at one point you uh, described like uh, this quest to make order of a chaotic world through intellectual mastery. I think we have to apply that to to these ideas and but not just think about them, actually put them in action. Yeah, and put them to action with love. Oh. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Bashir. I really appreciate this. Thank you for uh, taking the time to organize this conversation. I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm so glad we could get it worked out. Thanks for listening to this conversation with Dr. Derek Smith. And now let me leave you with some words from the Baha'i writings. It is not for him to pride himself who loveth his own country, but rather for him who loveth the whole world. Thank you for listening, and I hope to see you next time.